Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're going to be doing the movie Con Air, which was kind of a collective pick between both of us, but I'm pretty certain that Austin has a bit more history with it than I do. <laughs> so Is that the case? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, the way we pretty much picked this movie was just we asked the Ouija board that we have. Yeah. And then it came back with the name, and we're like, we have no problems with Nick Cage. We can do this movie. Is it a good movie? Not especially but there are explosions in it uh there's violence there's a good cast there's ving rames and there's a bunny so what else do you want probably a lot but this is what we have to offer for you so uh we, yeah we were in the mood for a cage fueled action movie of from just, the 90s yes just yes. sort of a, sort of a a low effort low brain cell empty head cage at his prime movie and we had a couple of other ideas bouncing around, but eventually we decided that this one <laughs> would be the one we did. Um, I didn't have that much of a history of this movie. I saw it like a decade ago, probably on Spike TV. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so true. Spike TV or TNT or yeah. one of those. And that that was when I was like, because Nicolas Cage had already become a meme at that point. Like, oh, yeah. Because after National Treasure, basically everybody. has been, been a meme for a while. Yeah. And I appreciated that movie for that reason. But upon rewatching it, it's interesting because this movie is sort of floating in a liminal space between, like, the cast of this movie are too accomplished of actors for this movie to be bad. They work the best that they can with the shitty, shitty material that they have. But the script and pacing and editing of everything is kind of too bad to make it a good movie i would say mostly the script yeah I mean, we get big explosions you can't fault them for that that is true yeah and a lot of and the practical sets and the practical stunts in a lot of this are very impressive it's just peak 90s nonsense yes which uh, is good that's a good thing it is and it's hard to yeah. take this like it's hard to take offense from this movie in certain <laughs> areas like if somebody like had an impassioned defense on why they fucking hate Con Air, I'd be very interested to hear it, but I I don't think that person exists. Yeah, there's no. It's hard to really attack this movie for any of its own particular faults. But I, I do agree with you. Where like, I, I guess the liminal space this movie occupies is between good and bad. Yes, <laughs> when, when it's all said and done. But it, I think it also occupies this weird nexus of like thoughts on action movies from the 90s and contemporary attitudes towards uh, prisoners and uh, the idea of, like, the carceral state. You know, like, the idea that, um, you know, a lot of these prison movies are, uh, no pun intended, putting the prison system we have in the U.S. on trial so often because they have mm -hmm. an innocent uh, an innocent protagonist and that's kind of the same situation here and we're going to get more into it more in the commentary track but i think we can both agree that the discourse on prisons and criminals throughout the 90s is the, the 90s is something that's like distinctly different from uh previous decades in american history well and it was the age of the super the predators movies. yeah yeah super predator discourse and um i think you can definitely notice that in the movies i mean the other big cage action movies from this period you've got the rock and you've got like face off the same year all three of these movies are like i do love face off face off is fun john woo is great yes we love face off um but all three of these movies are kind of prison adjacent and they all feature kind of like a super max notorious prison you know in, in their plot somehow. yeah and uh, even more specific, Max, every single one of these movies, they drop the title of the movie. Oh, God. Yeah. So maybe this was all Nicolas Cage is doing. But I think... <laughs> he did change the script of this movie, which we'll get into <laughs> yes. later. But but I do think... I'm very interested, even though this movie is maybe not the best movie, it has a great cast and it has explosions. And I'm really interested to dive into that conception of criminals and prisoners that we see evolve um, and culminate in a movie like this in the 90s. My research was more in the line of uh, looking at the production of this movie and how different people and changing hands sort of affect, affected the production of this film. But I'm I'm just excited to watch a stupid 90s action movie, have a good time, and if this isn't your thing, dear listeners, don't worry, we have more intellectually challenged things coming <laughs> up soon. Well, I guess I guess the thing that we both enjoy about earlier action movies like this, even though you can say they're stupid or whatever. Um, I think compared to nowadays, big movies like this were more 
accurately like an index of like concurrent attitudes in the culture. They reflect something more accurate about the culture that's consuming them and producing them than stuff like Marvel or Star Wars or any of these big intellectual property temple movies because those will always just refer back to like their goals for their particular brand. And this, even though it's kind of trashy, we will always have a sort of admiration for movies like this because they do reflect back to a type of culture, even if it's revealing things that are, you know, uh, inaccurate or... Uh, bad. Yes, <laughs> bad. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we want to spoil too much more of our thoughts for the intro, so I'd yeah. say let's all go on a flight on Con Air. Let's hop aboard Con Air. Well, audience, I hope you're as excited as we are to watch fucking Nicolas Cage beat the shit out of convicts and drunks and everybody drunks. in between. Who's drunk in this movie? Literally the people in the oh, first the fight scene yeah, of the movie. Right. Never mind. Are they drunk? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Belligerently so. That's the first scene where this movie really just departs from reality. Because I got to say, I frankly do not believe that these fucking Alabama hicks would be like, you're a Marine, I hate you. Yeah. They'd be like, sir, can I suck your cock? Well, about that, this entire like opening sequence with the stock footage and the, yeah. the Rangers and whatnot. Obvious stock footage. Yes, this was added late into the, at least the script writing process. This was completely changed because Nicolas Cage talked with the director. They got a new director on and... Simon West. Yes. Yes. He... Cage basically approached him and was like, what if we made my character an army ranger that was returning from war? Do you know what he was before? Is no. that why he's showing up in a tugboat for some reason in the first scene? Because <laughs> you're thinking army ranger, are they going to give him a lift back to his home or something? And he shows up in a tugboat. Well, as we know, like none of the normal things that would normally happen <laughs> in this movie, like normally they would just kick you out of the door of the prison and like, okay, you're free to go now. Here's a bus ticket, maybe. They wouldn't unnecessarily move you to a prison across the country and then release you. Exactly. They could spend money just to spite you. <laughs> no, but Nicolas Cage, one of his weird fucking insane quirks is that he has to be the fucking hero of every movie that he's in. Hyperbolically so. Yes. So he, it wasn't just okay that he was like a morally good prisoner. He had to be a completely 100% justified army ranger. Yes. In he order. had to be fucking Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> By the way, can we just say, I, I really just want to comment on how funny it is where Nick Cage is seeing his wife after leaving the Rangers for the first time. She is she has no baby bump whatsoever, but he's no. just in the middle of this bar pressing his ear up against her stomach. You know, after he was done filming The Rock, he went back to live in Alabama for a while in order to truly perfect his accent for this movie. Are you fucking kidding me? No, I'm not at all. <laughs> Which is fucking hilarious <laughs> of how silly the southern accent no one has ever talked the way he has in this movie <laughs> uh, i yeah. actually am curious like about his process for arriving at that accent because it is the most bizarre thing about his performance in this movie i mean it goes without saying that it's terrible um it's not really like a consistent accent either it's just like but at the same time, it's like such a definite. He makes the choice so confidently that it it makes it weird in addition to being terrible, which makes it more interesting. <sighs> like, what type of brain decides I'm going to do that? Was that also his decision where he was like, he's an army ranger and it talks like this? Muhammad Bird. I, I, I don't know. Well, like, what his thought process was. Was it supposed to make him seem like down to earth and relatable, like a real, like salt of the earth American yeah. that everybody can relate to? You know, idiots, <laughs> the common clay. I, I, I generally think that like, we have to remember Nicholas Cage comes from a very wealthy family. <laughs> like, yes. Nicholas Coppola. Yes. We know your true identity. Can we also just comment upon how he's somehow in the middle of like an oil field now? It's the bar right outside the oil field. Yes. And the oil, <laughs> there's just a massive oil derrick and it's like this spill off oil is like igniting. 
I mean, it looks cool. Like th- this reminds me in some of its visuals, kind of like Mortal Kombat. Uh, and, and we're going to bring up comparisons to Mortal Kombat later, I'm sure. Yes. Um, because it shares that type of 90s aesthetic where it just seems like characters walk into a setting that's just like a music video s- or setting where it's like, it's just designed to be cool. It's like, why does this parking lot have a fucking oil derrick in it? I don't know. But you know it's, it's you've got fire on part of the screen and everything's blue and it's raining. It's like, okay, I like the way it looks and it's nice. Yes, it's stupid. It's one of those, like, there's so many things in this movie that, like, you're not supposed to think about yeah. too much. It's stupid, but I like it. I like this. I would prefer that they have, you know, an action scene where there's a bunch of steam coming out of nowhere and fire in the background. And I like the fact that, despite the fact that there's so many edits during that fight scene, you never lose track of what's happening. It always grounds you in the wide shot again to be like, okay, this is where everybody is. This is what's going on. And it it's... A stark contrast. We did Taken recently, and like, there's so many action scenes where it's just utter nonsense, and you're like, I guess fucking he's winning this fight because he's action man, but I have no idea what the fuck is going on in context of the fight. But this is just like, okay, where he hits this guy, hits the arm. Okay, wide shot again. We see where this guy is. We see where this guy is relative to that, and it's very grounding. It's <laughs> I I do miss that about dumb action movies of the '90s. It's and not earlier. completely nonsensical. Yes, yeah. Um, I love. Oh my god, that's my favorite fucking cut in the yes. film. The ridiculous, like the 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 woman crying to Con Air. <laughs> Yes, his wife is in tears in the courtroom. Which, can I also just say, like, just blatantly hilarious fuck up on on his lawyer's part where he's like, listen, if you admit to it, you'll probably only get four years. That's and then a, the judge is like, seven years? <laughs> that's that's a common occurrence in the criminal justice system. I'm not, this movie is not intelligent enough that I think that, like, it was trying to comment on that at all. No. But that is a thing with public defenders where it's just like, you have... 800 cases that yeah. you have to do by this week. Yeah. And we're not trying to like shit on public defenders. No, 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 no. 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 If we're, we're shitting on the system that places like a lot of public defenders in underfunded situations where they, there's like one of them. If I like have to not people. shit on any particular type of lawyer, it's going to be a <laughs> public defender. <laughs> yeah. So, but... We're on the team of public defenders, but it is, you're right. It is something that happens in this country. Uh, it's a very unfortunate thing where like, you know, uh, they just have to, you know, do a prioritization of what they're going through. And they're like, listen, just plead guilty to this or whatever, because there's just simply not enough resources for people in any sort of welfare sense in this country. And public defenders is one of those. But it's not the public defender's fault. No. This montage sequence is actually, it's slightly heartwarming, I want to say. It's as like emotional as this movie gets. It's much more emotional than the spoiler reunion we get at the end of the film. I think it's just sort of a nice sort of way to pass the time. And the closest that like it does the entire rest of the emotional core of this movie has to rest on the letters that they exchange between his time in prison and back and forth. And I think it does a fairly good job of that. It makes it believable enough. I don't know. (sighs) I don't know. No, no, don't hold back, please. There's just no connection between him and his wife whatsoever. Oh, no. The the wife and daughter are plot conveniences in this movie. They're not real people. And it's also totally bizarre that, like, he hasn't... Apparently, he has not seen them face-to-face in seven years. They didn't have visitation. Well, no. He There's one throwaway line a bit later where he's just like, oh, I didn't want to see them, like, surrounded by murderers and evil people i want to see them f- when i'm free on my own terms it's like, what what i love this because nicholas cage learns origami in spanish it's hilarious and it, that never comes back no and you think because there's like a scene on i thought because i hadn't seen this in like 10 years when we yep. were reviewing it and he gets the little spanish translation dictionary and then on the plane there are two characters who are like we get a little subplot with like a colombian uh, cartel we get the colombian yeah. cartel and there are two characters talking back and forth yeah, yeah, yeah. on the plane in spanish so i'm like oh well he's gonna use the fact that he knows spanish and nobody else knows that to his advantage no no how dare you assume <laughs> that's gonna be set yeah. up we have chekhov's spanish to english dictionary <laughs> <laughs> 
But we do get Chekhov's bunny. Yes. What which, do you think about that? We traded the dictionary for the bunny. It's stupid, but <laughs> it does lead to the stupidest action one-liner in this movie. The, the funniest thing is that the bunny it just becomes like a fucking damsel in distress. Yeah. It's never something he uses to solve a problem. It just becomes a problem. Also, I'm noticing now there there's so many shots in this montage with the credit sequence of a uh, massive a massive pair of dye like close up of dye and I wonder why that is. I've seen it like 6 times now and now I'm curious. But Max, uh before we get too much further in this movie, I want to sort of establish the the primary dichotomy that drives this movie and a lot of prison movies because um we talked about this before and I feel like you're on the whole a little bit less familiar with like the prison genre yeah. than, than I might be. And it is a loose genre. It is not as well defined a genre as something like the Western or sci-fi or, you know, what have you. Um, but I think it's something that I haven't intentionally sought out and tried to learn about, but it's something I've become more interested in over the past few years, depiction of prison and criminals uh, in American film, particularly. And, uh, I feel like I love how we both just paused <laughs> the oh. play and revealed it was called the jailbird. Get it guys. Get it. I don't mind it. It's fine. <laughs> the U S government would actually do that. So, um, but, uh, the, the interesting thing about a lot of these jail movies is that for the vast majority of them, especially in the U S the, the main character, the protagonist is going to be someone who's innocent. And that means that the sort of plot structure and uh, general conception of all these movies is about someone being persecuted unfairly. So these movies, almost inherently in their nature, try to set up some sort of conflict about the individual coming into conflict with the forces of the state. And yet, they always find a way to reconcile that uh, without completely abandoning the idea of like the, the state's authority being justified. There's never that moment of revolution. They always go back to the status quo beforehand. And um, that's something that we're going to see at play in this movie. And it's going to lead to a number of contradictions in this movie where it's like, yeah, we are brought up to the like conclusion, right to the edge of the conclusion that, you know, the state and its authority is unjust, but the movie never commits to doing that. And that's an interesting thing to pay attention to throughout this movie because we're going to see it a lot. Uh, but this is a good thing because we're introduced to our government characters <laughs> for the first time. And I think this is a good time to sort of segue off what you were saying, where this movie has a bit of an identity crisis with who's good in this film. Yes. Uh, the answer is Nicolas Cage as a spoiler. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> the innocent hero is the ultimate good guy. Because this movie struggles because it was made in the 90s, as we said, the era of super predators. And there's all these terrible people that we need to lock up in these huge, super expensive security prisons. The, trust trust us, this isn't a continuation of the war on drugs and an excuse to get unpaid labor out yeah. of people. I would say the war on drugs and super predator stuff, like you said, intimately related to yes. one another. Yeah, but this movie also completely realizes that like, the feds aren't cool at all. Yeah. This movie, it, it's, this movie isn't great, but it's weird because it has a great sense of who it's trying to appeal to. It just like fumbles and trying to appeal to them where it's like, Oh man, we're trying to appeal to as many people as possible. Right? So in appealing to as many people as possible, what it does is it again, heightens those contradictions that we're talking about. And like you're saying, it's like, okay, we have to depict the feds as bad guys. They have to be losers. They have to be stuffy assholes who park in handicapped parking spots. But also, we have to fight against them by having, like, supervillains on the plane. Like, we have to side with them against the supervillains. Because they're technically they're technically in the right, because the law is right, but they're also fucking dweebs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only dweebs follow the law. Yeah. This movie has is so dedicated to not making some sort of ideological commitment. So it just says that, like, okay, the only thing I know for sure is that Nick Cage is virtuous. <laughs> That's the only thing he commits to. 
Everyone else, it's you know, we'll, it's it's on a gradient. We'll see. John Cusack is a little bit better than the other guys. He seems like the best representative of the government in this movie. But uh, obviously, Cole Meany uh, is terrible. But Max, within that dichotomy, though, you're talking about this identity crisis. I'm curious what you think about this. Do you think that conflict and drama of this movie is perpetuated either... We have two options, right? It's perpetuated by the inherently evil prisoners, or is it perpetuated by a flaw in the institution that is holding them incarcerated? I wish I could say one or the other, mm-hmm. but it's neither, because the if we even saw, like, a couple of more characters that were innocent that had been fucked over by, like, an overzealous DEA yeah, or fucking just, like, we get this guy. Ving Rhames. Ving Rhames, who is playing a thinly veiled leader of the Black Panther Party. He's part of the quote-unquote Black Gorillas. Oh, yeah, and, oh, boy, do we not have (laughs) time to unpack all of that. He's basically, like, like, like a Huey Newton or like but yeah, Fred if, Hampton guy. If we dive, yeah, dove into that more of just like, oh, he's not really like he shouldn't be in the Ultramax violent prison. He's which a, it's for he's a political prisoner. Yes, yeah, and that's another thing this movie does based on what you're saying and in how it treats these prisoners. It does it completely elides all differences between these prisoners. And it's like no, Ving Rhames is straight up like a political prisoner, and if this was like a real story <laughs> somehow. Uh, and we were looking back on this historically. I can speak for both of us, I think, in saying that we would view Ving Rhames as the most morally upright person <laughs> in this movie, and it's not close. Yes. Uh, compared to Cyrus the Virus, the most 90s fucking <laughs> villain name it. ever. He could either be a DJ or... Uh, a hacker. <laughs> yes. it's, he sounds like he should be from the movie Hackers. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> DJ or a hacker. I also just love the sequence because they're straight up just like, yep, this is a WWE intro scene. We're just having all our nicknamed like wrestling bad guys come yes. into the airplane. Here's Sergeant Killfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dave Chappelle. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Was da- is Dave Chappelle in this movie just to be like, huh, we got Dave Chappelle in our I don't movie. know why he's in this movie. I don't know what he was known for at this point in his career. Was I that- think he does fine, though, in this movie. He's fine, but like his role is almost like filled up by the problematic gay trans drag queen character that we have later on. Yeah, that also... And I say that... Kind of baffling. And I say that as a commentary on how little... 90s cinema gave a shit about queer culture and just like you know they're 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 weird they're queer they're feminine this is how we're gonna treat them at the same time max the movie still has contradictions in that because we don't know anything about that person we don't know their gender we don't know their sexual identity we just know that they they act in a way that's stereotypically feminine and uh they enjoy women's clothing however i if they are a woman we never see any of the other prisoners misgender them. <laughs> no. So again, weird contradictions. The, this movie has contradictions because like a lot of these prison movies, it's trying to set up this conflict where you have the you know persecuted innocent hero. And what that inevitably means is that the guards and institution they represent will be painted as flawed and unjust, which means a lot of the criminals might be painted with a sympathetic brush. And no, but like the criminals don't, like make fun of that character like no i was was expecting a lot of like prison rape jokes which is its own like thing we can get into about prison movies but no cyrus fucking gives them a gun (laughs) it's just like yeah fucking help us out they respect them (laughs) and that's what i'm talking about with these contradictions because you watch that and it's it's in opposition to other things the movie is telling you but then you're like i actually see a lot more solidarity and camaraderie among some of these prisoners than any of these fucking guards. But I brought up that character because like that character kind of just fills in what Dave Chappelle was. Yeah. Doing they, they come to be like a sort of like comic relief type of character. Mm. Cole Meany saying goodbye to his twink. Oh, uh, Cole Meany. My, my stereotypical, let's bring up Star Trek. 
where at least one time an episode. I'm loving I'm loving Max's Star Trek corner. I I'm I enjoy the fact that like the the thing I got out of quarantine was to binge a lot of Star Trek. Do and, do they have jail in Star Trek? Uh, kind of. It depends. Like the next generation, it's much more just like oh, prison is a thing that the Romulans do because they're the evil <laughs> secret state. But like. Deep Space Nine does something that I enjoy, which is, like, interrogate, like, the lofty ideals that Star Trek has been building and, like, now we do terrible shit, too. But I've just brought up Star Trek because, obviously, he plays Chief O'Brien in both Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Funnily enough, I hate him in in Star Trek The Next Generation. He's a boring, just like, oh, I'm Irish and I have an Asian wife and we always get in fights because I want her to eat potatoes and she's trying to get me to eat sushi. And it's like the most cringy shit ever and I hate it. But then he, like like a lot of characters in Deep Space Nine, they actually give him room to grow and turn into a character and he does some excellent acting on that show. So I'm yeah. a fan of him. So I was Colmini's excited good. to see him when I rewatched this. He's good in this movie. He's great at being an asshole. Yes, you fucking hate him the entire movie and you should. And I know we've brought it up, but let's just reiterate right now as we're being introduced to Danny Trejo, who maybe gets the shortest drift of all the characters and actors in this movie because I, I know we both love Danny Trejo. Yes. Uh, this movie has an amazing cast. We both grew up on Spy Kids. We have to. <laughs> yeah. He is their uncle. Yes, he's Uncle Machete. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many like times I ripped tape off of my <laughs> my upper lip in kindergarten and yelled at people, I'm not your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> he's, oh God, he's wonderful. He's also, I think we've mentioned this before, but he uh, he, a couple of years ago, beat Christopher Lee's record for being the actor who was killed the most on screen. How's Sean Bean not in the mix? Sean Bean has a lot of high profile deaths. He doesn't have like the sheer numbers, but also it, he does die consistently. He does, but is he, well, he doesn't do as much schlock. Exactly. That's if he the thing. did, then he would die more, but no, Chris, yeah. Christopher Lee was in a b- bunch of schlock horror films for a long time. So that's yeah. why he held the record. Yeah. And Danny Trejo, was in a lot of movies as like cartel thug number three and got killed a lot before he started really taking off. (laughs) Yes. So that's, that's how he finally got there. And it's a shame. His character is one of the characters that you're just like, Oh, you're just the fucking worst. Okay. Well, his character, I, I don't believe it. And I'm going to elaborate on what it means when I say that. But like, again, what I'm talking about with the contradictions in this movie, and again, you're what you're saying about the identity crisis in what, what this movie, who does this movie think is the real bad guy? This movie wants it to have it both ways. It wants the federal government to be the bad guys because they're terrible and they're fucking things up. But it also wants uh, the prisoners to be like insanely evil supervillains. Right. Uh, and, uh, I, I guess my point with this is that it plants characters like Johnny 23 into the story to like force the audience emotional reaction. It's trying to manipulate you basically where it's like, yes, yeah, see this guy, he's raped 23 women. That's why they call him Johnny 23. And it's like, that just seems too contrived. It seems like you're trying way too hard to make me hate these characters instead of just like, showing me a reason to hate them with my own eyes. You're just telling me he's a rapist, you know? And we see that later on, but, like, one, it's uncomfortable, and two, like, between the the league of supervillains that we have yeah. in this movie, did we really need Johnny 23? Well, he's just there to solidify the fact that they need to be hated. Because, again, if you look at the way that they interact with one another, I think... You would went. You would inevitably wind up being a lot more sympathetic to these these characters. Like, I'm sorry. Like, maybe it has something a lot to do with the actors too. I know that the actors did quite a bit of improvisation on this movie in different parts, and they sort of rethought and and tried out different things for different takes and different scenes, um, and changed quite a bit of the script. Um, but I mean, these are really good actors, and we don't. The movie doesn't earn enough of our hatred for them. It spends a lot more time just telling us we should hate them because it assumes that we would think these characters are evil for this and that, you know? It goes in with the 90s mindset yes. of just like yeah. us already hating anybody who's in jail without us being explicitly told that they're yeah. a good person You're right. Him. It, it, 90s mindset. That's why we don't necessarily have that reaction now. And, it, and that's the part of this movie that would seem probably the most dated. 
you know, where it's like we look at all these people and it's just like I just this just doesn't have a bearing on reality because I, I don't make any of these assumptions about prison or what it's like to be a prisoner. With Ving Rhames' character probably most explicitly. Yeah, no, that's that's the one yeah. we're really talking about. It's just like that jumped out to both of us yeah. when it, we saw it. We're just it's like, like if the, it was Angela Davis. Can you imagine if Angela Davis was Ving Rhames in this? Oh, God. That'd How be... out of place and weird that would be. Yeah. You're just like, what? This we also is don't. Super villain we don't get any comment on woman prisoners in this. <laughs> no, no. This is a male movie all yes. the way. And female prison films are their own sort of subgenre that's quite um, specific and different than than other prison films. But also, Max, in addition to Ving Rhames, I also just think the like Cyrus character is an interesting look at that, where they, they only pay lip service to it, but John Cusack is like, this guy is a product of the system. He literally says that. And then Cole Meany's like, oh, so you think it's our fault? And he's like, well, this guy has been in jail for 25 years of his life. And he spent like 10 years. He's 36 years old. So like, what the fuck do you think? But again, the movie doesn't, the movie introduces these characters, but it does not explore them. It tells us enough about them to get an idea. But the only thing it wants us to walk away from, from that introduction with is the fact that we should hate them and that they're evil. It views their placement in prison as 100% justified. We did. And, like, the movie goes out of its way. Like, we were talking about the Vic Rames character, but, like, he did just brutally murder several guards. So, like, the movie is trying to show us, just like, oh, don't worry. If you hadn't any moral qualms about yeah. him beforehand, he, he is evil. He's going along with Cyrus the virus, his master plan to gain control of the airplane. Which, again, I do, again, we're now moving into a contradiction area where it's like, you told me he's like the Black Panthers. I don't think a Black Panther would do that. Yeah, I have like what reason would someone that like they have a bigger mission than just personal freedom, and th- they do give lip service to that later on, of Nick Cage trying to be like, oh, why are you taking orders from a cracker? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, Vic Rames is just like I, I'll, I'll play the role until I'm free to go, and then we have. But my... it doesn't mean anything. No, it doesn't. Yeah, like nothing about their criminal pasts mean anything because this movie just uses it as like window dressing for their characters. He's like, a criminal, so he has like Cyrus is like a criminal, so he has connections to the fucking Colombian cartels. Yeah. I guess it's like why he's been out of prison for like ten years of his life. How does he know the Colombian cartels? Also, how did he get two PhDs? We passed that line, but he's technically Dr. Cyrus the Virus. Yes. Can you imagine being known as Dr. Virus? I would fucking love that. By the way, this is our first movie with John Malkovich. What, what do you think about John Malkovich? Got any opinions on him? Uh, not any strong ones, honestly. Um, I think he's he's good in this movie. He's not... I think he's his role starts off strong. I think as the movie goes on, it's more of just like an endless <laughs> Nicolas Cage quest, but I think he yeah. starts off fairly well. Um, I made a joke that like he's Hannibal Lecter cause he's just like, he self-educated himself to two doctorates <laughs> while in prison. Yes. But we get like an actual Hannibal Lecter character <laughs> yes. later on who doesn't, we'll, we'll get to Mr. Buscemi <laughs> in the film. To premiere Khrushchev. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. Returning to the podcast, Steve Buscemi. <laughs> but I have stronger opinions on Steve Buscemi, I think, than I do on John Malkovich. But. I think John Malkovich is, like, stealthily important to this movie working. This movie was a big hit. And I think a lot of that has to do with its cast and, you know, carrying up a lot of the sort of incoherent script. But also John Malkovich specifically is kind of like an Axel through which a lot of the drama sort of um, pivots. And I don't know. I think I think he does a really good job playing up to the right moments. You know, he's appropriately big and he's appropriately villainous. And uh, he doesn't make it completely cartoonish either. It, it just kind of works. What a fucking stupid thing. This is the dumbest movie he could have done. Well, Again, I, I guess he was worried that fucking Dave Chappelle was going to find the gun in his sock when he was undoing his chains. But like, yeah. But, I mean, all these other fucking people have secret weapons. Why couldn't you just say, like, oh, I was planning to escape, too? (laughs) 
Drug Enforcement Agency, the most intimidating branch of the government. Goddamn. I mean, again, this everything about the DEA and the federal government is positioned to being like incompetent and stupid. You should shoot him. What? Like who should you shoot who? The D like in this situation, the DEA should shoot him. Should shoot who? Cyrus. Like But Sh- Cyrus is behind the girl. And she's saying to shoot. I'm just saying. The well, entire movie could have been over. Yeah. If only you knew. You would you would cause Con Air to go on for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> another hour and a half. Oh yeah, I guess. This movie does have like a return of the kings like ending thing where it's like, is this over or not? I don't know. Okay, the movie could have ended here. Okay, the movie could have ended here. Okay, the movie could have ended. I do here. like that they just end in like, you know, Las Vegas. That's always fun. Yeah. At least with the return of the king, like every time to- I know people like say that's a problem, but like I love the Lord of the Rings movies. So sure. like whenever I find out the movie's not over again, then I'm just like, Yay, we get more movie. <laughs> but Oh man, we have more time before the Hobbit begins. Yeah. Oh no. I have unpopular opinions that like I I there are 15 minutes of the first Hobbit movie that I enjoy, but like you like Radagast the shit smear. I I do like Radagast. I you think, do? I do actually. Why? Uh, I think they overuse him, and I think they make him too goofy. But I like the take of like this goofy nonsensical woodland wizard. I think it fits with the childish nature of the the tone that the original Hobbit book was written in. Yeah, except that. It's stupid, though, is the problem. It is. They could have made him, like, a hippie who gets high all the time, and it could have been funny that way, and he could have been silly that way, but instead he's just like, and also, I know people gave a lot of shit for the rabbit sled, but that, like, 100% feels like I mean, that's fine. Yeah. The rabbits are fine. Yeah. That's not the problem. But no, I, I the don't. fact that he is bird shit in his hair. Yes. Okay. You could have done without that. That was a little <laughs> bit extra. <laughs> yes. But I'm saying I don't mind that take on Radagast. <laughs> but Ugh. um. But yeah. No. Other than that, the Hobbit movies are fucking atrocious. I, <laughs> I do enjoy the opening sequence of the first Hobbit movie. But like, it does make me hungry, doesn't it? When they're yeah. all singing about food, and that's certainly its own thing. That's its own accomplishment. But Max, we're talking over uh, what I can only compare to like a Battleship Potemkin moment (laughs) of these like convicts rising up with one another and trying to find a way to cooperate. Uh, Again, if, if if we're going on based on what the movie is showing us and not what it's telling us, you have to have more sympathy for the convicts. You have to. And... Okay, not to be Mr. Point Out Mistakes in Movie Guy, because it doesn't matter. This is Con Air. But Cyrus is like, oh, you can't go because they're expecting white prisoners. And then in the lineup of prisoners that they, <laughs> we see, there's a black guy in the line there. Well, they have to replace several of them. Several of them died in the uh, original escape attempt, right? So they have to replace several of them, and they're all white people. No, but there, I'm saying in like the line of prisoners they have bagged there is a black guy. <laughs> Yeah, but some black people were going already. It's just the people they have to replace were white. I think he said, okay, I interpreted it. He said, like, the people they're expecting are white. Okay. So, well, either way, what we can agree upon is that the guards who are investigating uh, Cyrus's cell are maybe the dumbest characters in this movie. And we'll see why a little bit later. Uh, They have the most hilarious, like, fuck up I've ever seen. And somehow so believable. I don't, I don't know. Oh, no. So, Max, you know what I would like? You think he would burn this stuff after he fucking left prison? What stuff? The the stuff they're about to find. You in mean the like the anarchist cookbook that he has? Yes. In his, his little hidey hole? I had actually never seen... Like, are there physical copies of the anarchist cookbook? I've only ever seen it, like, circulated online as a PDF. I've I don't never, know. I don't know if, like... What publishing house would be like, yes, let's make physical copies of the anarchist cookbook. I don't know. I have no idea. Listeners, let us know. Are there physical copies of the Anarchist book? If this movie wasn't so dumb, it would have done something cooler than that. It would have had like the... the It's shorthand though. It's like, okay, he was learning how to make fucking bombs. This movie isn't like thinking about anarchy as like a political philosophy, but 
in the script, there's that possibility. It's well, like, have, I want to see this anarchist and the Black Panther like team up. Have you read the anarchist cookbook? Because no. it, it's literally, it's not, it's divorced from political ideology. It's how to make guerrilla weapons. Well, then I would change it for the mini manual of the urban guerrilla or something. Yes. I'd say make, make this movie more political. Because then it would be a lot more interesting. But every but the point is everybody knows the anarchist cookbook. Everybody knows like what it's for. Yeah, it's movie short. Like I I want to see the dream version of this movie. Is you have all these good actors, and I want to see like, you know, the Black Panther and these other prisoners like talk about these like you know resistance ideals and and their convictions and everything while they're trying to like take over this plane. You don't even have to make the movie less stupid. <laughs> you could just if you, as long as you include that, you don't have to change anything. It'd be just just as stupid and just as explodey and loud as it is otherwise. And this is another example. The guard treats him like shit. The guard treats him like shit. And Cyrus the virus is the first character in this movie that actually like takes an interest in him to, enough to learn his name. Yeah. It's like what are you doing, movie? <laughs> Also, that's like the la- like largest recording device I've ever seen. Only the best for the DEA. Most covert. <laughs> They're like recording the conversation. Like It looks like a fucking 35 millimeter <laughs> film reel. The virus. The virus. Cyrus the coronavirus. That's what they call him when he gets to Mexico. Yes. Hey, <laughs> the <laughs> anarchist cookbook. There it is. He has blueprints and coded messages from the Colombian embassy and you know he has a lot of like resources it seems like you could find a less convoluted way to to escape i don't know but then the movie wouldn't happen i mean that's the real thing of this movie too and uh, the real thing of a lot of prison movies um that are not real really prison movies but like prison adjacent movies like this is what i call prison adjacent action movie um because uh, then we would be forced to face, like, the political reality of the fact of, like, you brought up the war on drugs. Like, the government is one of the primary, like, focal points through which drugs enter this country and all of that stuff, right? We know that the government would sell drugs to try to, like, track criminals and gain leverage on people, right? This is something they did for, what, like, 20-something years at least? It, by this point, even, in the movie, Right? Like, the movie Deep Cover is the reality of what the government is doing. Uh, So they would not imprison Cyrus the virus if he had some sort of connection to, uh, you know, the Colombian mafia or whatever. They would try to leverage that. There's so many, yeah. If I mean, if this was made post-9-11, everybody in this plane would have fucking ties to Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Well, that's that, I think, is definitely the evolution of the prison film. Uh, post 9-11 is that we shift to a more like political prisoner situation and i think that's an interesting thing for looking at these 90 movies 90s movies in particular because in reference to that like super predator discourse and the idea of like the war on drugs that's something that really ramps up as stuff like the cold war is winding down a little bit and it makes me wonder whether or not in like the american popular imagination we you know, we were looking for new enemies to sort of invent for ourselves. And one of those was, you know, just people who would be in jail, you know, convicts. I mean, we got to keep justifying the military industrial complex and like insane, you know, uh, uh, government control and uh, the militants of the U S government somehow. Right, Max? Yeah. Oh, we're introduced to swamp thing. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Swamp Thing. My favorite DC superhero. (laughs) MC Ganey, Swamp Thing. Famous actor and notorious sex object. (laughs) Is that what gets you hot, Austin? (laughs) MC Ganey. Yeah, that's that's your thing. I didn't know what I saw MC Ganey in first. I think Lost. I think I saw him in Lost. But he's just another really great character. Are you a big Lost fan? You bring it up quite a bit. Or were you? I mean, I watched it like 10 years ago. I liked it when I was a kid because I was like, this is cool. And it was cool for a while. No, I heard. I, it was it was like the original of like the ending ruined this show. <laughs> I mean, there is some genuinely good writing in, in Lost. I'm not going to lie. 
Um, the ending is definitely not, does not do justice to the rest of it. But uh, up until that point, there is some genuinely solid stuff. We're getting the, oh. This is all, this is all hilarious to me because this is further just like super villain shit where it's like, why would he have to do any of that? Why would he leave any of this behind, like you said? Why would he have to cut the eyes out of, like, the fucking uh, Last Supper painting copy that he has to try to read the secret message from the Colombians? Oh, here's Steve Buscemi. In oh, Steve Buscemi. The first of many scenes that you can't, obviously can't tell were added later. <laughs> it is astonishing of just, like, I guess Steve Buscemi's in the movie now. Yeah, I, I do really enjoy how this movie is like, yeah, we're having the WWE like super villain entrance scene in the beginning. And then like 15 minutes later, they're like, we're doing it again. <laughs> and this time we have Steve Buscemi in like a gimp suit. What do you think of that? <laughs> and a guy named Swamp Thing. No, but I'm like imagining this movie now, like you could edit out Steve Buscemi <laughs> completely and it doesn't matter. He no, it doesn't matter. He doesn't contribute to the movie at all. But I, I still like that he's in No, this. I'm glad that he's here. It's just, like, baffling. At least that. we know he got paid. Yes. He got paid to mostly sit down and wear, like, a fucking, like, BDSM collar. Standard I prison issue BDSM <laughs> collar. <laughs> yes. Me oh. Carson. Meet Carson City, the secret message from The Last Supper. <laughs> Do you think it's intentional that there you might draw some sort of political connection between the Last Supper painting and, like, these prisoners escaping as, like, outlaws against, like, an imperial state? Or no? Do you think that's not the case? I'm sorry, I'm more focused on the... Don't touch anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the most embarrassing. Like, that's the weirdest. It's honestly hilarious. It reminds me of uh, a moment in Alice's Adventures in Wonderlands when she's falling down the hole and she grabs that jar of, like, honey yeah. as she's falling. And the jar of honey says honey. And then the late beneath the label, it says empty. And then she opens it and she's like, oh, it's empty. She's like, I don't know what I was expecting. Yeah, it's the it's literally the dead dove. <laughs> Do not open <laughs> meme. Yeah, and then, like... They see the bomb box that says do not open and the guard just opens it. And it's like, what the fuck did you think was going to happen? <laughs> Honestly, stuff like that is kind of hilarious because it's like a joke that like doesn't have any payoff because it's exactly what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> Except because of the way it commits to that, it's still funny. Cyrus the virus. Max, do you know what your uh, prison nickname would be? Maximum security. Maximum secure. Max maximum security. <laughs> How about you, Austin? I don't know. Maybe uh, an animal. The dog. I'll call myself the dog. Austin from Austin. Yeah, that's not clever. That's not going to work. <laughs> Let's go, lesbians. Let's go. Oh, no. Oh, no. Dave Chappelle is getting left behind. Oh, no. He was how too will, busy hitting on this woman. How will we ever survive? He was really carrying this movie on his shoulders up he's, until He's now. not bad. Do you have any opinions on Dave Chappelle in general? Um, I hate him now. <laughs> he is annoying now, yeah. And I know he's trying to like make his comeback of like, oh, I didn't mean any of the shit I said during Trump's presidency, but like, I do think the Chappelle show was fucking great in its prime, and I think he deserves credit for that, and I do think he had some quality stand-up back in the day. But... I, I I think he's a man past his prime, and I like. Yeah, I don't. Did he veer into right wing stuff? I not, just haven't paid attention. Not really to him. right wing, but he was just more of like a Trump apologist of just like 
it, it, it was just came across as annoying. Like, why didn't you shut the fuck up? Oh, you mean like the type of people that like liberals paint leftists as? And not even, but like he was like when Trump first took office and he's, he like did this whole special of just like people giving Trump shit for stuff. And like you didn't know any of the stuff that you're giving Trump shit for now. So shut up. And it's like he's like, give Trump a chance. And I'm like, uh, that's the wrong conclusion. Yeah. You should have been taking the leftist approach by saying shut up, but also like I'm encouraging your political awakening. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, was just, it was a weird thing to hear from Chappelle. But I I don't know. I, I I said I hate him now. That that's a little bit too strong. But I I I just don't care about him anymore. So yeah. like I it's not like honestly on the spectrum of male comedians, it seems like there's a lot of just like bad apples. Yeah. <laughs> in the grouping of male comedians. So maybe Dave Chappelle on the in the grand scheme of things is like not the worst. He hasn't I don't think he's molested anybody yet. So yeah, like, he's yet to like whip out his dick at like multiple women. And then treat it as a joke. Do you have any opinions on John Cusack? I meant to ask you that earlier. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm interested in the <laughs> the heated debate. Oh, you find Cole Meany attractive, huh? Yes, obviously. I was sweating throughout of all Star Trek The Next Generation. I was like, oh, yeah, you work those transporters. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> but do you not have any opinions on, on Jen Cusack? I think I like him. He's not always in the best movies, but... Yeah, I, I think it's because of that. I think I have associations yeah. with him with pretty shitty movies. But sometimes he does choose some really good stuff. I, I do enjoy... Uh, I remember... Well, I remember enjoying Say Anything. Um, I also like... Uh, recently, I like Grand Piano with him and Elijah Wood. That movie is just... That's a blast, that movie. I like that movie. Um, and then of course, right around this time he was in uh, like gross point blank and, and he was in the grifters a few years before this, the grifters is amazing. I love that movie. We got to do a movie with Annette Benning at some point talking about like primetime nineties casting, like Annette Benning. I love how this would never happen now. Cause we just have a drone fucking destroy the planet. <laughs> <instantaneously. laughs> that is another th contradiction in this where it's like, why are they, why do they not blow them up? And also like, we only have three helicopters. In it seems like blowing them up would be the most politically convenient thing you could do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It seems like the government would blow them up even if they didn't escape and just try to paint it to the media that they escaped because they had all these bad apples in one basket, you know? Especially Ving Rhames, where they're like, we got to get rid of this fucking political rabble rouser. You yeah, know? blame it on him, and then you can police more black people, and then you'll <laughs> be able to increase your Think about your agenda. how willing the U.S. government is to assassinate, like, black political leaders, especially if they're radical. Or just people like, they murdered Fred Hampton in his bed. Yeah, this past week we got that letter that everybody on Twitter was freaking out about the, from Malcolm X's family, from a cop in his deathbed confession that basically confirms that the FBI assassinated Malcolm X. It's like... Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck? What world were you people living in? <laughs> we all knew this already. Yeah. But no, like, they, yeah, no, they, we we would drone strike this plane out of the sky yeah. fucking tantiously. No, in mean, our version of this movie, Max, they might not even escape and the government would try to destroy this plane just because Ving Rhames is on it. They say he's like a major cultural figure. And you know what's interesting, Max, is they don't even try to leverage that at all. He's a guy who they're talking about, like... Uh, they're adapting a movie from like his books and Denzel Washington is going to play like him in, in like an autobiographical film film. Uh, but like, there's no way Cyrus, the genius, the virus can't like <laughs> leverage that. I thought he was like a mastermind. Wouldn't a lot of people care if this guy was assassinated or died or whatever, but no, this movie's not interested in that because it's just window dressing and, once these criminals are loose, that's all they are. They're just criminals, and it's okay to dismiss them. They don't have humanity. They're just evil sock puppets that we can punch. But they are charming, though, because that's what you get when you get these good actors. They're just like, yep, that's, I like it. That's I like what I was it. saying beforehand. Is like, If this movie had like a shit cast... 
Yes. Like it's like, oh like, my God. If it was like the kind of movie that Nick Cage is in today where it's like, he's the biggest name star and everybody else is just a fucking nobody. Yeah. Can you imagine how miserable this film would be? Yeah. It would just be a slog to sit through. Cause like, this isn't one of Nick Cage's like, he's fun in this movie. Yeah. But he, he's not like unhinged. He's not off the wall the entire time. I, I feel like part of the fun too is like, it, like his accent is unhinged, but people just enjoy watching him be this weird, like, fucking long-haired weirdo in this premise you know but he the whole thing of his performance in this is his commitment to the act you know the accent it'd be different if this was like his character from snake eyes which in my mind is like peak 90s yes. i'm insane nicholas cage without winning an oscar get the get the question out of in people's minds of why he's listening to people. Why would a black person listen to a white person? I mean, again, it's stupid. Uh, we can talk about it until we're blue in the face, but no member of the Black Panthers would have done this. No. Because, again, they have a greater or social awareness of everything they do than any of these characters. Like, Ving Rhames is a political figure. If he didn't like break out of jail or whatever, I, well, actually, do do they say how long he's imprisoned? No, because I, if his sentence was up, he probably could have like run for office or something. Like that would have been the move, or, or maybe not run for office, but he would have gotten into some sort of political, you know, uh, leadership position somehow. That seems like it's more consistent with the character of someone who's like in the Black Panthers than to be like just a supervillain. So, Max, I want to bring up some interesting stuff about this movie in terms of its, like, generic substratum. Because the more I thought about it, the more I really came to the conclusion that this movie is not entirely a prison movie. I mean, it is a prison movie, but it relies on a generic structure that I find a lot more reminiscent of the Western. And specifically, Max, probably most reminiscent of what might be the most historically significant Western in history, Stagecoach, which was John Wayne's introduction to the American public. It wasn't his first film, but it was his first really big starring role. It was the thing that made John Wayne, John Wayne, Stagecoach, 1939. And in that movie, he plays a character named the Ringo Kid. And that movie, much like this one, is about a group of characters that are sort of stuck together in a tight space a stagecoach right and they're going on a journey from one place to the next across the desert and the Ringo kid breaks out of jail along the way to try to get revenge on some people who wronged him and in that movie they definitely view the Ringo kid's quest and his character as like a righteous goal you know he's the righteous westerner gunslinger he's the ambassador of like manhood in the wilderness and uh it just kind of reminds me of this because I can totally imagine a plot. This is basically like an updated plot where instead of like a stagecoach, it's, you know, a fancy airplane, you know? And I, I just feel like this is very similar to that Western structure. And you have that same sort of like ambassador of goodness character in, in Nicolas Cage, only it's far less sophisticated than it might be in like a John Ford movie. And he, he's just, like, comically good. He's not corrupted by prison at all. Yeah. Like we see early on in the movie, like, the prison's literally, like, on fire in an inmate yeah, riot. And yeah. he's just like, I'm going to take my nap in he, my bunk. He's good to the point where by the end of the movie, I think I hate him. Where yeah. he has no incentive to try to hunt down them as they escape. No, it's like, like, why are you doing this? You're just a once narc. The, once the plane is off in Las Vegas, like, go. Just go. What the fuck is your problem? Yeah. Your family's already there for some reason, so... Just just go. He's just the he becomes the kid who asks he's like, You forgot to assign us homework. Yeah. And it's irritating. It makes me hate him. But Max, I also think in connecting this to the Western, I think, you know, more broadly, I started to realize, thinking about this movie, that prison films and the Western are kind of more intimately connected than it might be first at first readily apparent um 
Because the Western is so much based upon this idea of like the promise of America, right? It's that westward expansion. We're heading west. It's manifest destiny. It's it's this idea that you have autonomy and you you can control yourself. <laughs> oh, we're looking. I'm at sorry. Go on. Dave Chappelle stuck underneath the wheel. The Dave Chappelle dummy in that is just so fucking terrible. They made his face like hilarious. Like, you couldn't have Dave Chappelle fucking lie there, lie on set for 10 seconds. I don't know. I don't know. Could they only afford Dave Chappelle for five minutes? <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe he was really expensive. All I know is that if I was drawing something on his shirt to send a message, it would have been really funny to just do a giant dick and balls. That would have been funny. But yeah, uh, talking about the Western, right? And its relationship to the idea of that American dream. And the promise of it. I think it's interesting to look at prison films as kind of like a progression and inversion of that because it's like the ultimate uh, rejection of that American dream, you know? And if you look at why Nicolas Cage was imprisoned, is it not the same thing that would make the Western character heroic? Yeah, no, and you do... There is a theme of just like sometimes the old gunslingers were like former army and whatnot. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. And I, I can see that. It, it's a similar dynamic of just like. And in a lot of the Western films, too, you have like the encroachment of the government and civilization. Yeah. It's the same theme where it's this idea of like individualism versus, you know, society and, and that push and pull. Right. And uh I think it's the same thing in relationship to the violence where like Nick Cage at the beginning of this movie, he has to commit an act of violence to uphold his convictions and like his code, so to speak. Right. And that's the same thing that would happen in a Western is, you know, the, the man establishes his manhood and his virility and his ideology uh, through acts of violence uh, throughout the film. And in so doing, instantiates like a new type of society in their own image. But in this one, you know, there that Western space is all closed down. It doesn't exist anymore. So when you have those acts of violence, it becomes like an act of excessive masculinity. And uh, it, necess it necessitates them being locked up. It kind of reminds me of Riddick, too, um, oh, when we God. did Pitch Black. I mean... Sorry, I'm just getting a migraine thinking about that movie. Regardless of what you think about Pitch Black... You have to admit that it's definitely a movie that also uses that Western substructure. No, yeah, it does. I just hate it. <laughs> I, th I would say that out of every movie we've watched on the podcast, I would watch them at least once again, except for Pitch Black. I don't, I don't have any desire to see that movie again. You would watch Bird Box again? Yes. Are you uh, kidding me? I hate it, but like if I had a friend that like hadn't seen bird box and was like interested in why I hated it it's so much. It's not exciting. No, it's not. But like, I, I find it a good case study in bad screenwriting and bad structure, but it makes you upset. Like this, it does. Yeah. The bad screen writing of like bird box is like, makes you, it's like, it makes me feel like I'm staring at like the death of cinema in the, in the face. <laughs> Because it's like this was reverse engineered to so they could have a meme, you it, know? But Bird Box was like the, the meme too, but like the fact, the only notable thing about Bird Box is it got popular despite the fact that like the script was an utter catastrophe. <laughs> yes. It got popular because of the meme, yeah. They, they accomplished exactly what they wanted. Men. So do they not identify as men? I don't is know. Is that the implication of that? They call, they call them sister. Yeah. And Sorry, we should clarify. We just saw that character that we were talking about with the um sort of uh, a of a feminine nature, yeah. yes. The unspecified gender, right? Uh Ving Rames walks by wearing a pants of uh, a pair of like spangly glasses yes. and then the character turns and goes, "Men." Men. Like it's ridiculous that what Yes, Vings but they Rames call her like, "Oh, they're my glasses now, sister." Yeah. So so is that supposed to do, imply that they're not a man? Do, do the prisoners respect this person's pronouns? Because if so... They don't insult them for it. That's yeah. the big thing. Is like, regardless of what... Because we, we don't know, right? All we know is that what we see. And what we see is that they do not target or insult this person. Which is obviously a lot more than you could say probably for the fucking guards. 
And I do think it's entirely unintentional that the movie would have any sort of positive attitude about the prisoners because it's so insistent upon telling us about how evil they are. But yes. And it goes without saying of, yeah, the nature of just queer coding and yes, the fact that any, any queer representation you might be able to squeeze out of films like these are villainous, sexual in nature and duplicitous in evil. Yeah. But <laughs> As I've seen argued online numerous times, all that did was make a generation of people hot for villains. That's <laughs> <laughs> the best thing that could happen. But also, uh, I, I I think the movie's added toward, attitude towards the criminals is further emphasized by the fact of like this movie not really having any stakes. It's supposed to have personal stakes for Nicolas Cage, right? But ostensibly, Max, he could just not go with them, right? Would they... What would they do? Would they kill him? No, they would just let like let him go, right? Why would killing him help them in their plan? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He just wants to make sure that his friend has insulin and doesn't die from like shock. You know? <sighs> we should mention, by the way, if you're not watching this with us, part of the motivation for Nicolas Cage staying the on re- this airplane yes, is... Yes, the his- reason the movie isn't 20 minutes long. <laughs> Like, because he could just get off. He doesn't want to be with these criminals. But these criminals are like, that's fine. You can just go. The reason why Nicolas Cage is staying is because his friend uh, is a diabetic and he needs insulin and he doesn't want his friend to pass out and he doesn't trust these criminals to take care of his friend. Also, there's a female guard that he's like, I I wouldn't want them to dishonor you. Yeah. I have to respect... Oh, God. I have to make sure Johnny 23 doesn't become Johnny 24. Ugh. Ugh. That's a literal line, though, later. Yes, I know. That. Um, it's still cringy. <laughs> <laughs> so is the, having as kicker as your license plate? No, nah, I would do that. You couldn't, actually. There's There was this whole like long thing about like the DMV rejected uh, license plates. Yeah, they got plates. all those Twitter threads. Yeah. I, I disagree with them often. I often find those Twitter threads to be like, why did you say no to this? What the fuck is wrong with you? Put the bunny back in the box. Probably the most famous line. Which is so weird. Put the bunny back in the box. (laughs) I also just appreciate how committed they are to making Billy Bedlam's teeth just green. In this sequence, they straight up like painted yellow. Yeah, they on put his like teeth. some mustard in his mouth. And <laughs> yes, just scargle this. <laughs> his or like it almost looks like a like an early like digital intermediate thing where they just made his like mouth yellow. Yeah, <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Also, this this combat scene is kind of laughable. I don't. It's hard to do fights in like enclosed areas like this it's an interesting choice but you have to do it here because there's no other like it looks separated like place it just makes me reminds me of like them fighting as if they're in like a chuck e cheese ball pit yeah it's just like there's not enough space for anything should have put the bunny back in the box he should have put the bunny down so that's the payoff of the bunny but it's not the only time in this movie that the bunny will become a damsel in distress Oh, shit. (laughs) All of this could have been cut out from the movie. It's just to establish Chief O'Brien as a fucking idiot. If that aircraft's carrying prisoners, then I'm Elvis Presley. I do think that this is... This... The the idea of having all these fucking scenes feels like it's building towards the stupidity of like aughts big movies like this. Like it, it it's something I associate a little bit more with like Roland Emmerich. Yeah, like Roland Emmer- Emmerich. Emmerich or Bay in that era. Well, I mean, Bruckheimer probably his most notable artistic collaboration is with Michael Bay. Yes, that's what yeah. I was gonna say, and it's notable because he produced a lot of Bay's movies. Yeah, especially shit like Bad Boys Two. Holy shit! But, like, but also like. Michael Bay, especially over time, starts to have like these fucking like character actor heavy movies, you know, where you have like one main character, but then you just have like an abundance of side characters and then it just becomes fucking irritating. 
you know? And I think maybe part of that, too, is the absence of Don Simpson. I can't remember if we brought him up already during this commentary track, but um, I think you mentioned that this was really one of Jerry Bruckheimer's first solo, like, production efforts, and that's because one of his partners in producing stuff was Don Simpson. And Don, Don Simpson unfortunately passed uh, during, I think, right in the middle of producing The Rock. And um, it, it's interesting to sort of play like what if games with Don Simpson if he had survived, uh, because I sort of get the impression that maybe he kept directors like Michael Bay and producers like Jerry Bruckheimer a little bit more grounded and controlled uh-huh. than they would have been otherwise. Well, that's why Bay started fucking. I believe he produced a lot of his own movies because he was just tired of being told what to do. Sure, so. and he was able to. Yeah. I mean, he, he all his movies made a ton of money but like i would have been curious to see you know if don simpson had not died you know whether or not that would have changed the career trajectory of people like michael bay you know or tony scott is the other big director that jerry bruckheimer would work with although i think do you do you also agree that tony scott is better than michael bay oh 100 percent. yeah i have no love for michael bay i mean i not not even as a meme anymore i'm just done with him Stop, stop. Right. I don't know if I would like him as a person. I think I'm an apologist for him because he still has big explosions. And I kind of just admire that in this day and age. But like, I don't know. Real explosions. Pyrotechnics is what you mean. Yes. Rather than just like the the CGI, like fake looking shit. That and you- there is something impressive to being able to manage all of that. I just, these movies are often boring and often racist. And sexist and uncomfortable to watch. It's just like, I really. Know. How much shit do you want to put up with to get at like the pyrotechnics? Go watch fucking MythBusters. Like, <laughs> yes. I'm sure you can find some cool shit there, dude. Like, if all you want is like cool explosions, and whatnot, there are endless. But I guess my point is, with the right producer, I can see, like envision some sort of alternate career path for Michael Bay, where I'm like, fuck yeah. You know, no, there there is the alternate version of yeah. Michael Bay that continued to make interesting, good action movies. But like, like there are moments in The Rock that are I mean, it's a ridiculous movie, but genuinely trying to get at some sort of emotional confrontation. Right. I don't remember. Don't know if you know when the last time you saw The Rock was, but not not yet again. That's a Spike TV movie that I probably saw when I was 12 that I didn't give a shit about in its axe body spray slash monster energy drink sort of way. It is trying to like address different ideas of like nationality and what it means to, for a country to have like fidelity to its citizens, you know? Okay. But like, uh... but it's my point is that's a lot more than what Michael Bay would go on to do. You know, and I wish he had tried still. I missed out for years on a lot of action movies. Because I think I've brought this up before, but like I considered action movies to be like the jock movie. Like that's I I was it a particular type of action movie or um a lot of Michael Bay shit. And I, I did try to give him a chance later on. I think it was like in my early 20s. I'm just like, you know what? I found out a lot of things that people like universally hate on are like not as bad as they say. So sure. like, why not try to give Michael Bay a shot? Sure. I, I, I just came to like, oh, OK, no, he is bad. I, I didn't really like a lot of his stuff. But yeah. Like, I, I do wish that existed where there was like a non-sexist racist version of Michael Bay that like made high budget explosion packed fun movies. Yeah. Like he doesn't even have to make his movies less stupid. He just has to make it less irritating. It's like yeah. the racism and shit like that. It's irritating. And like, if you read interviews with Megan Fox about like how shittily she was treated. Yeah. On set with that. It's, it's just, just like, like, this is just like, I'm just fucking tired of this. Can't but you just, be normal and then like i think it was mad max fury road that made me just like oh right action movies can be good <laughs> well i mean that's its own that's yeah. its own separate the like michael, no but michael like, bay could never touch it's it sated that. my like it it tingled the taste buds i had of like oh this can be interesting this can be nice yeah like that's pyrotechnics stuff like that and like the you know john woo's best movies like that's pyrotechnics and like really excessive action in the hands of like a genuinely talented creative person, which I'm not sure Michael Bay is, but I do think he's like a good like field marshal where he can get a lot of shit done in movies and he will give you explosions. But I don't think, I don't know if he's capable of making a movie that's not just like utterly stupid. But again, sometimes that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. 
it's just, I'm trying to think of like what, because I don't, I don't tend to look into action movies as seriously as I do other genres. And I should, because that's, I hate that when people do that to horror movies is when they're just like, oh, you know, it's just cheap. Thrill. Sure. Sure. And I, I want to take people who like action movies seriously and look at their criticism. But like for this movie, it was hard because I kept finding like different reviews and like people who are doing retrospectives about it today. A lot of them are like, yeah, but it was fucking awesome. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> wasn't it great when he did this? And I'm just like, come on, I'm trying to work with you guys here. There's no like analysis going on. There, there is some, and it, but it's more just like how movies like this don't get made today, and what the actors have gone on to do since yeah. then. There's not, but it doesn't, you know, maybe not going into why or the specifics of what they mean yes, when they say that, or why it works. We know the things that appeal to us about this movie. We, I bet for both of us, we like that it's a premise movie. Yes. We like that uh, it is a movie that spent the energy to actually get good actors to elevate its dumbass concept. Um, we like that it's a movie that committed to a dumbass concept. And it doesn't, yeah, it didn't like, oh, we have a bunch of convicts on a plane and they're trying to escape somewhere. And it's like, you could have very easily done like, that's the first 10 minutes of the movie and then it yeah. turns into boring shit. But- and you and you don't damn yourself by having that because you have this like pit stop where they go and then they get back in the plane. Yeah. So you don't get th- fucking sick of the one setting. And they they did they do some good things in this movie. It's better than it should be, but it's not good. No. It, it I think it is very much just the image of a different type of movie. So the phrase like they don't make movies like this anymore is actually weirdly appropriate regardless of whether or not people realize it, because it's like this movie isn't particularly anything special, but it is definitively different than things that would be made nowadays. Like no one would make a movie like this nowadays and expect it to be a hit. No, it just wouldn't happen. It'd be straight to red box, <laughs> which honestly sucks. I would prefer to live in a movie where a mo- <laughs> I would prefer to live in a universe where movies like this are a hit. Yeah. I mean, this movie made a shit ton of money. It did. It was a hit. And technically, I was alive for it. Oh, yeah. We're getting the most surreal scene in the movie soon. Of I don't know what emotions are trying to be conveyed with the Steve Buscemi <laughs> the little Steve girls. Steve Buscemi little girl tea party. I, like I was saying to Austin before this, I think that's supposed to like convey like tension toward the audience. Because yeah. like, he's introduced as a Hannibal Lecter who said that he's wore a, a girl's hat head as a hat for three states while driving so like oh he's a dangerous psychopath but like we're supposed to be like oh he's gonna kill the little girl but then also like, max i think he was lying i don't think a fucking girl's head would fit on his head what the hell does that mean he is steve buscemi he does have a weird shaped head so so what you think a girl little girl's head could fit on his head it wasn't a little girl it was a woman no he said a little girl he said a that's girl. why it's so upsetting is that a girl yeah. Okay, but if he was trying to refer to an adult, he would say woman, not girl. I don't know how respectful Steve Buscemi's serial killer is supposed to be in this He's movie. supposed to be really respectful. That's his whole thing, is that he's, like, insane, but he has, like, his own, like, you know, mental code that he operates by. He's weirdly, like, the closest thing we get to, like, the authors commenting on the action of the movie. And, yeah, he's completely unnecessary. He was added in later, and it clearly shows because he like he's not interacting with the majority of the <laughs> the crew who <laughs> no he's just sitting there <laughs> in scenes that like could clearly be shot later because we still had the airplane set and we can <laughs> just have him talk yeah. to these people it's so awkward and i kind of love it i love it more because i was confused rewatching. i'm like wait a minute what is this doing what is the it's just so but funny. i mean like this scene in particular with the tea party is just like this is this is like beyond meaning. This is just the most random thing possible that they could have done. If you haven't seen this movie, I, I don't know if I could actually accurately like, can, like describe how random and surreal it feels in this film. They're like in a ghost town. You're like, no one lives in this town where they landed to refuel. There's or two people, like a guy who flew a plane that they almost crashed into and an old man who apparently like, I guess, runs the gas station that's broken down there. Yeah, who's apparently hiding the whole time. Yes. What the fuck is that? Why was he hiding? 
what is this town? What is this? Why is this girl existing in a trailer park in this like desert abandoned town? And why is she having a tea party? What? Like you could just as easily say that like Steve Buscemi is insane. Yeah, that's that's where I thought it was going. <laughs> Yes, but it doesn't actually indicate that. No, because he has the physical Barbie doll and he <laughs> yes. comes back with it. So, I don't know. <laughs> what was the point of that scene? I have no idea. Besides to get the fun scene later on where he's singing, we got the whole world in, in his hands. Which is supposed to be ironic, question mark? Max, seriously, of all the movies we've done on the show, that is like, this is one of the most random scenes that we've had in any movie we've talked about. And I, re- I have no idea what to make of it. All I know is that it changes this movie's overall opinion on the prisoners, where, again, it's trying to fit in those contradictions where it's like, no, they're insanely evil. But then it's like, oh, you thought he was so evil that he would skin this girl alive and then, like, shoot her a corpse into the sun or something? Yeah. And it's like, no, he was just nice, and they had a very fun tea party, and you're jealous you weren't there. That's it. That's all, that's all it offers. And it's like, are you telling me they're evil or what? I don't know. Well, because and later on, we f- he's like one of the few that survives and like gets out scot free. And I don't know if that's supposed to like, well, this was before like every movie needed sequel bait. But like if that movie was today, ah, yes, that would be the post credit scene. The Steve Buscemi sim- cinematic prisoner universe. No, but it would be like Con Air 2 where he's just like, oh, well, I they tried to do it and it was because they weren't as brilliant as me, discount Hannibal Lecter, and now I'll try to do it. And like that would be the stupid Con Air 2. Which just, apparently I from various things I found, apparently that was an idea floated around by Con Air 2. Yeah. But um at this point I think it's just like too long. Like they they'd floated the idea around um Maybe we'll just remake it. Yeah, the director had said he wanted to ask Nick Cage about it, but that was like 10 years ago. Yeah. So, eh. <laughs> I mean, what are the what a coincidence if Nick Cage got arrested and this happened again. Yeah. I don't think we need a Con Air 2. It's no. like it's like how they're it's saying like die hard. They're saying they're going to remake Face Off now and like don't you really don't need to. Face Off at least have has much more of a hook for like a remake. In this movie, yeah. Face Off, it's like I guess like if I, you chose the right actors and that's the, the thing. Right way. If I'm not interested, it's just Freaky Friday. It is, but like I have to be interested in both of the actors. Yeah, you do have to choose the right actors, and like you could get one completely right, and if I don't care about the second one, then it's going to be a miserable fucking experience, and I'm not going to like care about your film. And even though like I'm not a huge John Travolta stand, but I do love him when he's being stupid, and <laughs> I find it very funny. Hey, I'm John Travolta. Hey. Like that's that like Austin hates Battlefield Earth. I find it like a masterpiece of me laughing the entire time. I mean, it it just gets irritating after a while. I, There's not enough funny thing. The movie's so long. We did a prep episode on that years ago. And years and years, yeah. That to date is still the longest recording we have ever done. Do you remember how long that was? That was three and a half hours. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. To be fair, we talked a bunch up front about that, but like it is a very long movie and that was the first time I'd seen that movie. Uh, since we're that never, was upsetting. Since we're never going to do it on the podcast, I do love how like the book that that movie's based on is like the only book to have a jazz a, album a soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, as I, a, the book has a soundtrack, which is like one of the worst received jazz albums of all time. How do you? How, this is just a weird, random question, but how do you set up the soundtrack? You don't. Does it give you instructions where it's like on these pages you have to listen to this track and you just I have think to it's loop chapter it or... by chapter or something, but like I don't know. Man. Every chapter has the same tone. I don't know. Seems like a real challenge. I don't know. It's almost like the guy who did this invented Scientology. But... Inventing Scientology was genius. He totally did it cynically. He, oh no! He, like his, he was his just his like I just want it, tax breaks. No, his kid has said that it was a bet that he made with another science fiction author. He said it. He said it. There are interviews and, like, documentation of him, like, from, like, the 40s and 50s being, like, you know, if you wanted to make a lot of money, you just have to start a religion. That's what he said. That's from his own fucking mouth. And uh, thank God Scientology seems to be dying. I'm I'm happy about that. 
Uh, well, yeah, Tom Cruise doesn't talk about it at all. Uh, Tom Cruise, Cruise has almost transcended it. Yeah. Um, he. I think he wants to make Cruiseology. I think, speaking of uh, Travolta, I think he left. Um, oh. Okay. I know I know Beck. Beck was born into it, but I think he... he That's a little bit different. He, he yeah. got out of it recently. He was just like, no, I'm not associated with the Church of Scientology anymore. But. Yeah. Uh, but Max, I do think we've talked about that on the show. Have I ever sent you those jazz records where like... <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard like commissioned like a terrible like fusion jazz band yeah. to make like the anthems of Scientology and they would play in all their like centers and recruiting centers around the world just nonstop. Yikes. <laughs> just jazz 24 7. I'd sooner kill myself to be honest than listen to smooth jazz. <laughs> smooth I can accept jazz. like a little bit of jazz, but jazz 24 7, it's like, god damn. Oh my God, Max, it all comes back around because Tom Cruise has a really great monologue about jazz in the movie Collateral. Have you ever seen that movie? No, I have not. Oh my fucking God, we got to do Collateral. Are you a big fan of uh, Michael Mann as a director? Um, You know, what? I'm going to say no, but would this change my mind? I don't know. Like, Collateral is great. I know you're not the biggest Tom Cruise fan, but like, he is such an amazing villain in that movie. And he genuinely is great at playing a psychopath. I'm trying to think if there is another role that I like Tom Cruise in besides Lestat. Uh, I, you, would, you would like him in Collateral, I think. Because he's just playing himself in a lot of ways. But he's genuinely disturbing. He's horrifying. And Jamie Foxx is great in it. Um, There's the old man. <laughs> cool guys don't look at explosions. Of course not. What is happening with this girl? I'm so fucking confused. But uh, Max, no, Michael Mann also made movies like Thief and Heat and uh, Manhunter. So horror Jason. He also made the very interesting but not like great movie The Keep with Ian McKellen and yeah, Scott Glenn. I remember that one. Um. The Keep is underrated. It, unfortunately, The Keep is one of those movies where I think, you know, uh, he originally had like a three hour cut for it and it was supposed to be this very fascinating, like, you know, melodramatic epic. And then I think the studio uh, just chopped at the shit and then lost the uh, extra footage. So I don't know if there's a real version of The Keep floating out there, which sucks because a lot of the, there's some really neat stuff about The Keep. I, I love the design of like the golem in The Keep. We get what should be the most remembered, remembered line from this movie. What? That's a rock. <laughs> it is funny. And I love the extras, like, literal reaction shot they give him, where he's like, oh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if we've talked about this a lot on the show. I love it when movies give extras those little moments. They're because time it, to shine. Yeah. It makes the movie so much more fun. You know? Like, just because, well, it, it's... I think from a filmmaking point of view, oh, they're encouraging her. Good for her. Oh, in the dress. Yeah. Again, what the fuck is this movie's opinion? Does it want me to hate them or not? Or you know what, Max? The, mob, the movie probably thinks that it's like a terrible, ridiculous thing that they're, they're dressed as a girl. Right? Yeah. The movie thinks that them encouraging her is supposed to be fucking incriminating and vilifying. And I disagree. Yes, we disagree, but also it's just like, it's nice to see somebody treat a queer person nice in a 90s movie. <laughs> and isn't it such a weird context? Yeah. The, I mean, at the time, like, the representation you had for trans characters around this time, like, what was it? It was like... The best you can get is a movie that you watched recently. Yeah. Wild Zero. Yeah. If you okay, let's not love knows no concepts of nationality or gender. Let's, Just do it. <laughs> let's let's not spoil too much about this. But if you haven't yet to see Wild Zero, it's a little bit hard to find like Region A copies of this. I movie. found the last Region A copy I could like find online. You can find it online though. Yeah. Um, and it's just. It's just so much fun. It's basically like Buckaroo Banzai, except it's a Japanese rock rock kid uh, against zombies. 
It's uh, if that sounds appealing to you, you yes. need to watch this movie. I'm it's not, great. I've been listening to a lot of Guitar Wolf since I saw it. And <laughs> they're they're generally very. Fun. I do hear they're amazing. Like if I hear, okay, listeners, this is advice for you. I don't know what's happening with COVID or anything. Maybe it's going on for like another twenty five years, and we'll never see Guitar Wolf live again. But I have heard if you ever hear the opportunity to see, you know, Guitar Wolf live, you have to see them live. And why not? I hear their live shows are amazing. But no, Max, I mean, aside from that, as far as like, you know, trans representation in the 90s or not even trans representation, because I don't know if they would be queer. Queer representation yeah, is like, probably the best way to put it because they might not have been framing the conversations they were having about it in that way um at the time but queer representation the only other really big thing is a movie like the crying game yeah and the uh, crying game i was actually just watching an interesting video essay about, about the crying game about trans representation okay of, in that time and the crying game has the it has a double-edged sword of that where like it has a sweet ending and like they do try to treat the character with some respect. Yes, yes. But at the same time, it started a trope that went on for like a decade of the reveal the person is trans and then vom- Q vomiting. Right. The crying game is smarter than that. Yes. Where it's trying... But no, no, that happens in the crying game. Yeah. Right? I mean, it literally happens. Yes. But also the crying game is trying to make a point about the character who is reacting in that way yes it's not making like, a point. it's not the same intellectual level as like ace ventura pet detective no 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 um the crying game is much more sensitive to to trans people than uh, a lot of the you know that reaction would suggest um but, and then uh, other than that what's the other big ones in the 90s just fucking like the silence of the lambs but that's also like the misconception of it too. yes and you know, like i said before you have like the whole back and forth scene where the movie tries to save it of like i mean the movie does say it yeah it's everyone else being stupid it's just that nobody else remembers it but also like the movie doesn't draw clear distinct lines like having clarice say one line that trans people don't aren't normally serial killers doesn't make up for the fact that like buffalo bill is coded like queer and sexual and deviant and it really luxuriates in those scenes of his bizarreness yeah. where you know the famous moment where he fucking tucks his cock yeah uh, uh between his legs which also that's just amazing physical acting <laughs> I, that's like really incredible that he was able to do that that well and we have nicholas cage saying yeah equality for women there a true feminist icon <laughs> what <laughs> he's beating the shit out of uh <laughs> What? He's beating the shit out of the rapist while saying, don't treat women like that. <laughs> true, true feminist icon. Yes, we're, tr- we're beating the shit out of the fake rapist character that we invented for this movie. Every other character, even though they're cartoons, I could accept, but I can't accept Johnny 23. Like, Johnny 23 just isn't fucking real. No, when this movie just invented him to try to convince me to hate the prisoners. It's like, I don't hate them. I'm sorry. Johnny 23 doesn't exist. And like I, I like I hate Cyrus the virus in the context of like the movie because he's a terrible person. But like, is he? But also like, like you said, like he's (laughs) he's been institutionalized maybe constantly since he was eleven. The movie doesn't really make it clear if like he's in or out or if like yeah he did all of the terrible things when he was eleven years old and has been there. If a guy got two doctorate degrees in prison, I cannot explain to you the level of respect I would have for that person. I can't get one doctor degree outside of prison. Most people can't. Yeah. And I know like that's the common trope of like the hyper intelligent criminal yeah. type thing, but But I'm like Cyrus the virus just seems like a person who got royally fucked and tried to fight it. You know? And Cyrus the Virus, like, he doesn't do anything, like, morally re- reprehensible in this movie, does he? He does murder people, but, like, so does everybody else in this well, movie. he murders cops. <laughs> okay. So he, he slaughters animals, but still, like, that, <laughs> that's distasteful. And he didn't even bother making bacon, so, like... Yes. 
<laughs> By the way, Max, they uh, I remember watching like the behind the scenes thing like earlier this week for this, and they made a big deal of the fact that like this is the first time in a movie that a car was dragged through the air by an airplane. I'm like, yep. I guess so. <laughs> Congratulations! It's you like those. It's you like those, did it, guys. It's like those Guinness Book of World Records things where it's like most paper towels eaten with chopsticks in one minute, and you're like, <laughs> yes. "Shut the fuck up!" It's I like don't. Anything can be a Guinness World Record. <laughs> but you know what, Max? They did fucking drop the car. That's the thing. You gotta, yeah. you gotta admire that. Maybe that's not an inherent quality of this movie, but more an inherent quality of like '90s dumb movies. But like, that's why they have that this place in our heart, is because they will actually drop cars and explode things. But you know what? This movie lacks that I do kind of hold against it for a '90s movie. Not enough squibs. Yeah, I I was thinking no that. squibs because we did we well like we have recently watched Face Off. We've been thinking about trying to get into doing like a John Woo movie. Yeah. Yeah. And God, there are so many fucking squibs in Face Off. Maybe that's an unfair comparison. John Woo is great with anything with No, guns. but there are hardly any squibs in this movie. No. A you would expect at least a few. You just have people falling over when they're shot. I guess it's better than having like obnoxious like CGI like blood spurts and everything, but I don't know. Nothing can compare to squibs. It's just so satisfying. Oh my god, the bunny! So Max, again, getting back to this movie's condemnation of the criminals. For no reason. What are the stakes of this movie? What are the criminals gonna do? Um, they will take a plane to a I don't even know what they're delivering the drug cartel or like what the deal is, but basically like they get to the place they're going and they're free. So nothing, the, nothing. Uh, some criminals will be released into the world. That's it. It's not like they have a thermonuclear device on the plane and yeah. they're going to take down the U S's security grid. So the North Koreans can invade or whatever the fuck they just want to exist outside the U S. Yeah. They want to be free. Um, Basically, their crime is that they do not like this country, and the country is detaining them. And so, like, an easy way to fix that would be to, like, do, like, the Dark Knight Rises type thing. What's that? Where, so, in the Dark Knight Rises, you, like, you have Bane, who's there, and he starts, like, pointing out, like, the people of Gotham are, like, oppressed by the police. The police are lying to them. There's the financial systems that make a few people very wealthy. Sure. And the problem with having your villain say these things is, is your audience is going to agree with them. Yes, it's correct. That's the problem. So in order to make Bane a comic book villain, he also has super bombs that are going to blow up all <laughs> yes. of Gotham. Because for some reason, he he has class solidarity until he just decides to just blow everyone up. <laughs> yes. So Batman can punch him and the big dumb movie can it's end. It's the same problem that this movie has, where it's like... Oh man, we've actually raised like a real contradiction and problem in our society. Oh, make them super villains so we don't have to address it. <laughs> yeah. We have to eventually end up justifying uh the assassination and destruction of these super villains. Um so uh even though they're right, we have to make them rapists of 23 women. That's this movie's thinking. Yeah. And that's ultimately the way that a lot of prison movies go, honestly. Although, I, Max, we were talking about like the super predator discourse. I think there is something distinctly different about 90s films that have prisons compared to uh, previous decades. Um, well, because we're spent... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But Well, I was just going to say that like, you know, in previous decades, especially during like the classical Hollywood era, I feel like you find a lot more like sympathetic depictions of prison films you know your prisoners are viewed as much more like uh uh uniformly as like the protagonist and the system is often more uniformly depicted as unjust um and you have fewer movies like this that are kind of like prison adjacent action movies um and uh like i'm thinking of stuff like i'm a fugitive from a chain gang where that movie's like really fucking haunting and that one is really interesting, too, because like this movie, the main character played by Paul Muni. Oh, my God. 
Nick Cage just got shot in the arm and just didn't even react. He's too fucking cool. <laughs> yes, his hair is too long. Uh, but the main character in that movie, played by Paul Muni, uh, is an ex ex military guy, but he's clearly suffering from some sort of um, PTSD or post military like traumatic disorder that he's trying to work through. And then through like a wrong man situation, he ends up going into prison. But uh, that movie is really committed to having the system destroy him. You know, and in so doing, it really shows how like, no, the system is just like fucking evil. And I feel like that's something you don't get in 90s movies. I think they are really a lot more focused on trying to justify incarceration. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah. Is the fact that like we're spending all this fucking money on supermax prisons. We're still spending money on the war on drugs. Yeah. We're have all the super predator discourse to justify it all. And you just like this is propaganda it's the same yeah. type of thing that like when you got all those war movies post 9 11 justifying yeah how terrorists are subhuman and all these fucking yeah. actions and yeah. really back to our conversation from taken yeah taken is a great example of it and it's interesting too where like another similarity this has with taken what does the male psyche need in order to justify its violence it needs to like outsource its emotion onto like the body of a woman. You know what I mean? The guys who attacked Nicolas Cage at the beginning of the of this movie at the bar, oh, they were hollering at his wife. Uh, what is Nicolas Cage's goal in this movie? Oh, he's got to see his daughter. You know? It's the same vision of masculinity that it is using to try to justify violence. So, uh, I want to ask your opinion on this, Austin. What? So, Nicolas Cage had to fight his way into the cockpit here. Yeah. And... As we know, he's established he doesn't like treating women badly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we, we have the uh, queer character standing in front of him, and he's sort of struggling with them for a little bit. Yeah. And then he's about to punch them in the face and then just sort of casually slaps them aside, yes. aside instead. Yes. Is that progressive? <laughs> I don't know. I'm fascinated that you asked this question. Because it is a fascinating question. Because <laughs> it is, right? He just smacks the shit out of this person, and they're supposed to be evil, but he does refrain from punching them. <laughs> <laughs> this is the mind-bending shit where this movie is just trying too hard to commit to doing everything. So you re you result in like absolutely uh, hilariously inexplicable moments like that. This movie is so close to just being nice, but it's not. It's like, just accept that this character is a woman. Just do it. You know you want to, movie. You know you want to. You can do it. No, it's the 90s. Oh. We can barely do that today. Yeah, we can barely we have, do that We have today. Congress people putting signs saying there are only two sexes outside, which people wouldn't agree, disagree with you. It's just that you fucking idiots can't be bothered to Google the difference between sex and gender for two seconds. Yeah. And the most irritating thing about it today is like how frequently the discourse just occurs and then reoccurs online. How many times do people have to have like fucking shit explained to them? I understand like everyone, you know, young people are learning all the time and everything, but like that's not what this is. It is funny watching Gen Z have discourse that like I had on Tumblr in 2011. <laughs> just like get with the times, kids. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. And there's a lot of stuff about Gen Z too where, you know, me, I often find Gen Z to have some like weird <laughs> trends as well. I find them weirdly puritanical um, and everything, but also, you know, like it, 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 you know, culture swings on a pendulum and it makes sense that the pendulum would swing in an op opposite direction away from something, you know? Um, eh, and I, people want people to be treated fairly and yes. well and with respect. So, oh, look at that though. That's a fun plane crash. That's I they mean, put effort into this. This yeah. is just 90, 90s movies. You I know? mean, yes, the propeller blades are obviously CGI there, but like you, you built a full fucking plane set and you're crashing it through this thing and you're yeah, using editing absolutely. to make it look very absolutely. real. And that's again getting back to you know the passing of Don Simpson. I feel like this is the touch that we lose. You know when we yeah. lose Don Simpson, 
is uh, Don Simpson had a really good way of maybe keeping things grounded. Oh, look at all those fun fireworks. <laughs> yeah, just not, like, they're not even great. hiding the fact that they're fireworks. They're just Just fireworks. fucking do it. That's what I'm saying. Where it's like the great thing about these 90s movies, like you don't have to make it less stupid, you know? No, they call her lady. Why? What is the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? What the hell is going on? This movie is like accidentally more intelligent. Yeah, <laughs> more progressive than a lot of movies today. <laughs> and it's not trying to. And I, in it's fact, not I trying would, to be at all. And I'm certain if you talked to anybody involved in this movie, they'd they be would, like, what? <laughs> no, this is this was a joke character. That character existing was a joke. But <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's just sad that like that's the level we're at now. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's the true takeaway with this character is it's sad that we've made such little progress since then you know yes um and again like we should be able to have like stupid villain characters that are trans or whatever without like having it be a big deal you know yeah we should also can i just say that i love that john malkovich when he crawls out of the bottom of this plane he crawls out with like his head first going down yeah <laughs> it's just didn't like kick the thing i mean yeah, i guess you have to look to make sure there's like you're not just like going directly in front of cops when you're it's doing just that. like everything in this movie is a cartoon <laughs> <laughs> mr arnold oh god rubber arm <laughs> nicholas cage is free to go now you're free to go nicholas cage free to go you saved the world and you get the kiss the Woman. Guard. If I wasn't a married man, I'd fuck the shit out of you. Because I'm a <laughs> heterosexual male action hero. I would have dishonored you. We flew them right into the scene of the disaster. <laughs> Speaking of fucking the shit out of people, Max, can I just say that uh, Nicolas Cage at the beginning of the movie... He comes back and he's been in the military for like a while, right? Yeah. His wife is newly pregnant. What the fuck is that? His wife cheated on him. I was going to say it's like... He wasn't there. That's yeah. someone else's baby. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is Wait a minute. With? Yeah, because she wasn't visibly pregnant <laughs> yeah. at all. <laughs> she like fucked one of the people at this bar. That's why the guy was so mad. He's just like, I'm <laughs> yeah. having a kid with you. Who the fuck is this guy? With his terrible accent. You actually like this idiot? Oh, man. That's not his kid. <laughs> it's like one of those bumper stickers of just like, my, gr my girlfriend's husband's fights for your freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, even in the Return of the King, like extra ending, they're oh, still yeah. going all out. <laughs> this this happens. I mean, I I do hate that Nicolas Cage becomes just like a complete narc and chases them for no reason. What? Why are you doing this, Nicolas Cage? He's still a ranger at heart. I guess is supposed to be the thing. I mean, I guess that's getting back to the idea of like this movie's lineage with the western, right? And we, like we've said. One of the big things about the Western is like the Westerner gunslinger characters like outlaw code, you know, and that idea of the individual versus society. What makes the individual different compared to the society? Oh, it's their specific convictions that makes them different as a person, you know, and uh, I guess we're supposed to buy that Nicolas Cage's convictions is that he needs to kill fucking Cyrus the virus. Yeah, that's his entire life goal. Yeah, at this point. Has Cyrus, like, Cyrus barely wronged him the entire movie. Cyrus just said that he was going to kill his daughter, but it was probably him he just did, he saying did, it. But he said that after he realized that Nick Cage had been the one leaking information the entire time. Yeah. Also, what the fuck does Nick Cage care if these people escape in general? That's what I'm saying. Like, he... <sighs> He could wait until they got to wherever the fuck they were going and just be like, okay, can I get a flight home now? I, I think Nick Cage has proven that he could kill anyone that came into his, like, general orbit. Yes. Is Cyrus the Virus going to win hand-to-hand combat with Nick Cage? No, as we see here. 
What if he did escape? Would Cyrus the virus really try to get revenge on Nick Cage? Why would he care? Nothing about John Malkovich's performance indicates that he would care. Because John Malkovich is playing the character as an actual fucking human being. <laughs> By the way, have you ever seen Dangerous Liaisons? Uh, no. Oh, I've, I've heard. Man, that movie's delightful. Yeah, I've heard. I need the. I need to add a lot of sh- oh, stuff man. to my non-existent list. Oh <laughs> man, that movie is just. You know what that movie is, Max? It's kind of like Interview with the Vampire, but without vampires, and it's just like sex gossip. Ah, uh, okay. And it's just Glenn Close and John Malkovich going at it. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> what? John Malkovich? Yeah, the image of Glenn Close and John Malkovich just going at it, just fucking <laughs> hardcore. Speaking of getting fucked hardcore. Some people definitely would find John Malkovich to be the sexiest person. I know that for a fact. Yes. Oh, yeah, and we get his comical death scene. <laughs> Again, another death scene where it's like, where the fuck is he? No, but it's like poetry. It rhymes. You see, we begin the first act of violence that the movie starts next to an oil rig. Why is there money everywhere? Because it was an armored car. But, oh, okay. But we, it's poetry because the first act of violence in the movie happens next to an oil rig. And then the last act of violence in the movie happens oil rig. That's an oil rig or a machine press, whatever. I was trying to draw conclusions. But I, I am utterly baffled at what the fuck that machine is. Why it is in the middle of the Las Vegas strip. And how virus ended up on it. He landed in the middle of the road. Shut up. Where is that? Shut up. <laughs> if you're not watching this with us, listeners, uh, Cyrus the virus dies because he lands on a conveyor belt that then port- transports him underneath a giant like hydraulic Ooh, press. Nicholas Cage and bisexual lighting. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is pretty sophisticated, huh? That is the one thing I didn't really bring up about this movie so far is, uh, you know, exactly what type of action movie this is. Um, in the 80s, action films were really dominated by what people would call the hard-bodied action movie, which is embodied perfectly by Arnold Schwarzenegger, where they're, they reach almost homoerotic levels of fetishization of the male body, you know? And there's a lot of emphasis on the male body, like, at work, and struggling and suffering, right? Um, and it's a lot about like you know men uh, demonstrating a type of like physical domination over each other. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. These are the hard bodied eighties action heroes. It's not quite what this is, although we do get some hard bodied moments from this. I think this movie falls a lot more in line with like the nineties like high concept act action movie which I associate more with things like uh, speed, you know, which I I feel like was a big, like inaugurating moment for that. A a big transition point. Die Hard was probably the biggest where it's like, okay, we got a premise. In fact, the on paper, the premise of this movie kind of reads like Die Hard, right? We got a man on the inside with the bad guys. Um, And it's less focused on fetishizing the body of the hero so much as it is putting them in, in this context. Just real quick, can I say something to, oh, yeah, go. to piss off the audience? I've never particularly cared for Die Hard. I, I, really? I don't like it that much. I do like Die Hard. That's fine. I don't I, I understand why people like it, but I've I've never found Bruce Willis that appealing as an actor, and I I just don't generally like that movie. We should do it one day. Okay. I'd be curious to get the the like devil's advocate Max opinion on that movie. But speaking of Die Hard, you know who's in Die Hard 2? No. Colm Meany. Ooh, okay. Which also features airplanes. <laughs> what the fuck? There are a lot of airplane action movies in the 90s. The same year as this, you had uh, Air Force One, I think. Which, again, is a movie that builds a lot of fucking sympathy for its villain characters. fucking abysmal child actor. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are you going to do, Max? <laughs> Were you supposed to actually be happy when Nick Cage hands you a shitty bunny? Yes, I'd be happy if Nick Cage handed me anything. You're not a fucking five-year-old girl. True. <laughs> I have nothing to say to that. And you never have been. No. So I don't want to hear it from you. 
But what I do want to hear is the beautiful ending credit sound as this movie's... Oh, no. We're no, Max, the you didn't know that Steve Buscemi, he's now hitting the casino and he's drinking a pina colada. He's the only Woo! one who got the, the frilly drinks and the freaks because he's the freak. Yeah. Hey... Yeah, but the movie's over. Um, movie's over. I, we said at the beginning that this movie occupies a liminal space between good and bad. Oh, my God. Okay. Did you see that? That yeah. credit for the character's name was Sally Can't Dance was the name of that character with the ambiguous gender. And that sounds like Sally a dra- Can't Dance. That sounds like a fucking drag queen name, honestly. Um, I, I'm still unsure of what it is. But that character is fascinating. <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> Back, we said that this movie lo- occupies the liminal space between good and bad. That is true. Um, I do find it enjoyable. It's stupid. It is easy to pick apart. There's yeah. a lot of just like, eh, like this doesn't make sense. Why don't you do this? Yeah. You could have fixed this by doing that. But like, it's a very digestible action movie yeah. with a lovable cast that. I would say outside of Nicolas Cage kind of carry the movie by oh, itself. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there are worse things that you could watch with your time. Yeah. And I think it's the type of movie that I think is maybe not strong enough to stand up off on its own, but I think the more movies we do on the show and the more 90s action movies we do like this, I think movies like this become really valuable in being an index for like public opinion and like attitudes towards everything that's the subject of this movie at the time. I think it is a very interesting sort of like, I don't know, anthropological uh, text to look at in that way. Um, and that doesn't mean it's like the most interesting movie, but I, I do find the, the questions it raises kind of compelling, even though it's obvious that it's trying to avoid, do everything in its power to avoid answering them or really challenging its audience. Yes. The stuff that, a lot of the stuff that we like about this movie yeah. are the stuff that the movie's trying to actively not engage in. Yeah, <laughs> so. but it, it can't hide like the zeitgeist of when it was made, and that's an interesting thing to me. So yeah, uh, if you want to listen to more episodes of our show, potentially su- you know future stupid '90s action movies, uh, you can find more at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We've got episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. And now YouTube. Ooh. We're slowly uploading Don't all our episodes. Don't forget to like, episodes. comment, and subscribe. <laughs> oh, we can finally say that and mean it. <laughs> but yeah, we we uh, are slowly updating all our uh, older episodes onto YouTube, and we'll get them all up at some point. But yeah, so you got a, an abundance of ways to listen to our show. Uh, and I encourage you to listen to all of them. Give us a little five-star review on iTunes. Why yeah. don't you? Yeah, let us... And the comments on YouTube, you can talk with other people, see what kind of movies that the community wants us to do. And as you know, you can order us to do certain movies uh, by following the instructions on our on our episode posts uh, about how to uh, donate money and then show us the receipt and tell us what movie you want to do. Donate to, yeah, some cool charities. And- do you want us to watch Sallow? You can do that. Do you want us to watch Island of Death? You can do that. Do you want to make me watch Serbian film, a movie I have said numerous times has no value as a film and deserves to be burned? Go for it. Do you want to make us watch Shoah? You can do